So today we have uh, my great pleasure to introduce Drogor. So this today is uh, another incarnation of the Luminaries of Science series organized by NYU Abu Dhabi. And as you might recall, this series uh, we invite a very famous scientist and uh, great men of, and women of science to basically present to the public what they are doing and sometimes talk about their life. And uh, in every case, they give a lecture to the molecular and cell biology class when they talk to the undergrad and sophomore student and they tell them some really top of them, top notch type of research. In the evening, they are going to present something more lay public to you guys and try to describe what uh, uh, they think about. So Joe is a very, very special scientist. He's somebody who is very famous in one accused the Lasker Award in 2006. And as you might know, the Lasker Award is basically the, the Nobel Prize. Most people who got the, the Lasker got the Nobel Prize a few years later. And uh, I don't think it ever happened before, no? I don't think you get the Lasker after the Nobel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And uh, um, he has been actually at Carnegie since the mid 80s. And the reason why is at Carnegie because it's really a place where you can just be a pure scientist and be a pure scientist. So before that, he spent uh, maybe 20 years at Yale, where he was a professor like us. But he thought that maybe there was too many distractions from his science there. And so he decided in 84 to move to uh, uh, um, Carnegie Institution, which is a place where he can really dedicate himself to, to, to science. And Joe has refused throughout his life to take any administrative position, any uh, place where he could basically get distracted from his science. He wants to do, do the science. So today he say, my wife told me if I come to New York, I should wear a jacket and a tie. And I say, no, 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 it will not be you because you are a scientist. Scientists don't wear jackets and ties. So. <laughs> um, I should also mention that actually one of the previous speakers in this series was John Stein from Yale. And John actually was actually an undergrad in Joe's lab many, many years ago. And uh, uh, she's actually made it to becoming a, 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 also one of these luminaries of science. So uh, what Joe's achievement is basically uh, 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 is one of the master of cell biology, one of the people who basically invented cell biology. And he starts from some very technical things, like for example, inventing institute hybridization, which we all do every day in our labs, to basically looking at chromosome. And actually, his view of chromosome is quite amazing. So today, he's not going to tell you about chromosome, he's going to tell you about the tools that allow him to look at chromosome, and he's going to give a historical perspective on terms of, of a microscope. Don't expect to know how a confocal microscope or two photon microscope work, but try to see how the microscope was invented. So again, uh, very glad to have Joe here today, and uh, he's a great man of science, and uh, I try to listen to what he has to say. So, uh, as Claude said, this is not going to be a lecture on the science that I do. It's not even going to be a lecture on microscopy in the ordinary sense. But uh, one of my avocations, or well, maybe my only avocation, is collecting books in the history of science, particularly the history of microscopy and cell biology. And so I have learned a bit about the history of microscopy from a direct experience, and not from what you read in books because what you read in books, a lot of it is wrong. And so partly what I'm going to talk to you about today is the uh, invention of the microscope, which everybody says took place in 1600, but you'll see from what I have to say that there's a little bit of a question about exactly when it was invented. And the other thing which you always hear is that the cell theory, the way in which animals and plants are put together was a direct result of the invention of the microscope. And I also want to try to temper that statement uh, with a, a good deal of reservation about what was the real relationship between the invention of the microscope and the development of the cell theory. So those are, that's the theme. Uh, and I'm not a historian of science, so I, any uh, way in which I express this wrong or don't give the right credits and so forth, that's because I'm an amateur in this field myself. I, after I uh, chose the title here, Through the Looking Glass, uh, I was uh, talking to my wife, as I often do, and I uh, said, do you suppose everybody knows what Through the Looking Glass means? And she said, no, I don't think they will. So I will tell you, for the few of you, uh, 
those of you who are over 50 I probably know. Uh, Lewis Carroll was, uh, wrote uh, two famous uh, children's books in the 19th century. The first was called Alice in Wonderland, and the second was called Through the Looking Glass. And in the Through the Looking Glass, Alice walked through the mirror, which was called the looking glass, and when she got through on the other side, everything was inverted, and uh, she had all of these experiences in this inverted land. So uh, I'm going to take you through the looking glass, but the looking glass here is not a mirror, but it's the microscope. So that's, the, that's what the title means. So that's Alice uh, going through the looking glass in the famous uh, <coughs> illustration by Tenniel. To start with, uh, to discuss the history of the invention of the microscope, we really have to talk about glass and I'm not going to talk about it much, but just to remind you, if you didn't know it, I didn't know this uh, myself until fairly recently, glass was actually uh, discovered or invented, whichever you want to call it, uh, about 4,000 years ago. And by the time of the Romans, about 2,000 years ago, glass making was really uh, quite a high art. And this is just one example of thousands that you could see uh, either at the uh, uh, Corning uh, Glass uh, Museum or in any <coughs> museum almost anywhere in the world. <coughs> so uh, here's a, a Roman uh, a jug uh, from about uh, 1800 years ago and uh, this you can see is relatively clear glass. So there is no reason why the Romans couldn't have made lenses. And if they could have made lenses, they could have made microscopes and so forth. But they didn't. And uh, nobody really knows why they didn't. I mean, this kind of thing is for the historian of science. But uh, in fact, glass was used to make lenses for spectacles. And we actually know when that happened. And that happened in uh, 1286. And, but curiously enough, we know exactly when it happened, but we don't know who invented uh, the spectacle. But uh, a man by the name of Alessandro della Spina, who lived about 20 years later, uh, wrote that uh, he knew how to make glasses. And people have misread what he said into that he invented. He didn't say that. He said he learned from somebody else. But anyway, Alessandro della Spina is often given credit for inventing the spectacle, whereas he didn't. He, but he was a spectacle maker. And from about 1300 on, uh, spectacles were made mostly for people who were nearsighted. Uh, uh, spectacles for farsighted came much later. And we didn't get astigmatism correction, without which I would be totally blind until the 1800s, uh, when uh, astigmatism was uh, discovered and uh, the cure for it was uh, developed. But nevertheless, uh, the cure for nearsightedness was very simple. It's just a convex lens, which you stick in front of your eye. And as I said, it was invented about this time and became very popular, at least among the people who could afford it. And uh, then uh, you can begin to see spectacles appearing in paintings and drawings. And this is a good example. Uh, it's rather an amusing one because the artist who painted in the 1400s uh, painted St. Mark wearing spectacles. Uh, so uh, there's an anachronism there, obviously. St. Mark does not wear spectacles. Uh, I don't even know how his vision was, but uh, the, the anachronism, of course, is that he lived uh, 1400 before, uh, 1300 years before spectacles were invented. But nevertheless, you will find many images of people wearing spectacles from about uh, 1300 on. Uh, usually wealthy people, popes or cardinals or whatever, or saints. So <laughs> then the question is, uh, if spectacles were made uh, in 1300, why was it that uh, microscopes and telescopes uh, were invented in 1600. And I can't tell you that, except that it's a, it's a surprise, because uh, it, all you need to do is to take two spectacles 
and hold one at a distance and one close to your eye, and you'd have either a microscope or a telescope, depending upon whether you look, away, look at something far away or look at something close by. But uh, apparently, either people didn't do it or they didn't, uh, didn't figure out to put it in a tube so that you could actually hold it carefully uh, without dropping it. Um, but at any rate, uh, the, the books all say that the compound microscope and the telescope were both invented at the same time in 1600. Now, what, one of the things that I want to say is that despite the fact that you read this uh, numerous places, it's not really true, at least in terms of the microscope. And I, I want to go through just a little bit of what I mean by that statement and then give you some of the evidence that people were not using compound microscopes in 1600 or 1610 or 1620 even. Uh, and if, they had been, if it had been invented in 1600, they certainly wouldn't have used it by then. So that's, that's the first uh, theme that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is, you know, for those of you who are not professional uh, biologists or my this I'm going to give you the, the most, the most elementary uh, <coughs> statement about uh, lenses. So uh, there are two kinds of microscopes, so-called. One is the simple microscope, and the other is the compound microscope. The simple microscope is what you would call a hand lens, or a, a loop, or whatever, a magnifying glass. And the way you use that uh, simple microscope is you put, it, you put a specimen here, you put the lens here, and the image is actually formed on your retina. So there's no, what uh, physicists call the real image, uh, other than the image that is actually a combination of this lens and the lens that you have in your eye. So that is a simple, uh, sometimes called a simple microscope, uh, but more often it's called a, a, a single lens or a loop or a magnifying glass, whatever. <clears throat> now, uh, that image is a virtual image because it, there's no image out in the air. It's all in your eye. The, the other way that you can use exactly the same lens uh, is the following. You can just put the lens off by itself, put the specimen near it, but instead of putting your eye here, just go away and put a uh, piece of paper or ground glass or whatever you want right here. And depending upon the distance between the specimen and the lens and this distance here, you'll get a magnified image of the specimen. And that's a real image. And it's real in the sense that you can put a piece of paper there and see it. Uh, and well, that, that's the sense of it. It's real. Uh, the magnification is given by the ratio between this distance here and this distance here. So uh, although my image isn't quite right, uh, this would be about five five-fold magnification or ten-fold magnification because this distance is five or ten times that distance there. Mm -hmm. So that's a simple uh, microscope or a single lens used to form a real image. So what happens if you put your eye in this uh, system here? Well, since this is a real image and it's, it's something that actually exists in space, you can look at that real image with another magnifying glass. Okay? And if you do that, you have made a microscope, in this case, or if instead of having the specimen here, you have it off at infinity, you've made a telescope. So the reason people say that the microscope and the telescope were invented at the same time is because they both consist of a specimen, either a star or a bug, a lens, which forms the real image, and another lens which forms the virtual image inside your eye of the real image. Okay, so that's, that's as far as I'm going to go with the technical aspects of it. You can make that look a lot more like a microscope just by putting a uh, tube around it. And now <coughs> you have a uh, relatively simple compound microscope. Uh, this is the specimen, this is the objective lens. That's the primary image, that's the eye lens, and then your eye is part of the, the optical system. <coughs> now, as I said, uh, two lenses 
uh, at the end of a tube is either a microscope or a telescope. And it depends upon where you put the specimen. And also it depends a little bit on the relative curvature of this lens here. So if it's a very flat <coughs> lens, it's a telescope and you have to put the specimen far away. Uh, the closer you bring the specimen, the rounder you have to make that lens in order to get an image up here uh, of magnified. And, uh, but, but basically, it's two lenses, the specimen and your eye makes either a microscope or a telescope. And that's the reason why people said the two were invented at the same time. Uh, so uh, let me just show you, this is a telescope. And you can see basically you have a star you have a star way off there uh, somewhere. This is the primary uh, image forming. Here's the image that was produced by this lens, and then you look at it with another lens. So <coughs> in fact, uh, this combination of two lenses was invented, and we don't know precisely who did it. Uh, it was almost certainly in Holland, and by 1600, there were several people, including lawsuits about who invented it, uh, and litigation, and so forth. But <coughs> what we do know is that uh, Galileo heard about this, or read about it, or was told about it. It's not quite certain which. Uh, and he went and made himself a telescope, and fortunately, we still have Galileo's telescope, so there it is. That's the real thing. Uh, that's an image that I took uh, when it happened to be uh, in Stockholm uh, when I was uh, there for the, uh, visit the, uh, for the Nobel Prize about five years ago. So uh, that's the Galileo's telescope. There is a single lens here and a single lens here. And just to show you what they look like, uh, this telescope, that's the original. The lenses are not. Uh, these lenses are uh, replicas. But this is the front lens here of Galileo's telescope, or it's one made exactly like the original one. Uh, here's the uh, lens that would get closer to uh, the eye. So, <coughs> as we all know, um, in 1609-1610, uh, uh, Galileo uh, published a very famous uh, paper or book in which he described the uh, structure or the the, uh, uh, the moon in which you saw all of the uh, craters on the moon mm -hmm. and in particular he <coughs> described Jupiter and the four planets uh, the four satellites that uh, circulate around Jupiter, uh, showing, uh, as he uh, observed them over several days, that they were moving around uh, Jupiter, which you can easily see you just watch it over a matter of a few days. Those are called the four Galilean satellites because of Galileo, and revolutionized um, astronomy, and also got Galileo a big problems with the Pope, uh, and he was under house arrest basically for much of the rest of his life uh, because of uh, telling the truth about how the uh, solar system was put together, which was not the way the church uh, said the solar system was put together. Uh, anyway, so definitely we had telescopes by 1610 and one of the most famous papers and books in the history of science. So if the microscope had been invented at that time, wouldn't you think that there would be some famous book or something dating from that period? Well, there isn't. And the earliest image of a subject taken through a microscope, and all the books say a compound microscope, but there's no direct evidence that it was a compound microscope and not just a good magnifying glass. Uh, and let me just show it to you. <coughs> this is a, uh, an image here. It's in a book uh, by, published uh, or written by, uh, published by a man named Francesco Stavuti in 1630, 30 years after the supposed invention of the compound microscope. 
uh, there's a lot of things that are interesting about this image, and I could actually give a lecture, an entire lecture on this image. But let me just uh, tell you a few of the special things about it. First of all, this is not the first time this image was published. It was published five years earlier, not in a book, but as a broadside. And there are only supposedly seven copies of this broadside still in existence. I've never seen one of them. But they're very similar to this image. So it's clear that this image was simply copied from something that was drawn in 1625 into this book in 1630. Now this book is not a book about science. This is a book about poetry. And it's a translation into Italian, uh, the current Italian, from the first century Roman poet. And this image has nothing to do with what's in the book. It's just <laughs> stuck in the book. Uh, at a given page. Uh, there may be some reference to B. I, I don't read either Italian or Latin very well. There may be some reference to a B at some point. But this image actually has nothing to do with bees. And does anybody here recognize what it does have to do with? No. Okay. If you go to the Vatican and look around, you'll find all kinds. It's the Barberini coat of arms. <laughs> okay, three bees in this uh, range. So this uh, was uh, a sort of homage or uh, obeisance to the Pope, the Pope's family. So it, it obviously was taken. It was obviously drawn with the aid of a microscope. But this was not a scientific drawing in the ordinary sense of the word. Okay. So all right, that's 1630. Uh, when is the next image, do you imagine, that might have been taken with a microscope? Well, it's 1665. And it's, uh, there, there are a couple of tiny drawings which may or may not have been made with the microscope before then, but uh, the curious thing about the next uh, images is that uh, we really do have a full-blown compound microscope, uh, a full description of it, uh, and the, the images uh, made by one of the most famous scientists of the 17th century, Robert Hooke. Uh, <coughs> um, Robert Hooke probably does not, or does, does not get uh, the fame that he should, uh, because uh, he probably was as great a scientist as Newton, but uh, Newton was an overbearing character and uh, denigrated Hooke and promoted himself. And well, that's a long history. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, they were probably equally great scientists. Uh, but uh, you've all heard of Newton. You may not have heard of Hooke. You may not know much about it. But uh, among other things, what Robert Hooke did in uh, 1665, uh, he published a, a book. Uh, entitled the Micrographia, and it consists of 38 plates <coughs> of objects uh, viewed under the microscope. And the way this happened was uh, Robert Hooke was a member of the Royal Society of London, which was founded in 1660, and uh, at about 1665 he was commissioned to bring an image to, one of the, to every one of the weekly meetings and to discuss it. So he actually did these uh, as a series and eventually uh, published this uh, now <coughs> extraordinarily beautiful and famous book in which there are 38 uh, woodcuts, including uh, this image of his microscope. And what is quite clear from looking at this is this is a compound microscope. So these images were not done with a magnifying glass as maybe Stolides were. There's some question about it. How Stability did it, or who, who did those drawings. But nevertheless, this is clearly a compound microscope. Uh, down here is a small uh, lens which will send the magnified image up to here, and then you look at it with the eye lens up here. Uh, all of this is uh, illuminating the device here. You use a candle, a flame here, and a, a ball, and a globe of liquid here. <coughs> to uh, concentrate the light on the specimen down here. So basically it's a 
it gives uh, approximately what you'd get from a good uh, dissecting microscope nowadays. Uh, magnifications of roughly 20 to 50 times. But it was, in fact, a compound microscope. And uh, every textbook of biology, almost without exception, shows this picture. But the other, pic other thing they show is this picture. Uh, well, this, this, is a, a flea. this is a very famous uh, picture of a flea. And uh, if you have any doubts about uh, Robert Hooke's uh, veracity, uh, I can tell you that this is a female human flea, not a uh, male or female dog flea or cat flea. Uh, they're easily distinguishable by all the beautiful detail within here. And you can well imagine where he got this. <laughs> female human flea from. Uh, that uh, image has been reproduced thousands of times. And uh, nearly every uh, author from 1662 today, practically, who writes about the history of microscopy uh, has reproduced either this picture or one of the many plagiarized versions of this picture. And there's an interesting thing about plagiarizing uh, images. <coughs> this, of course, is a, um, an, uh, uh, an engraving. And you make an engraving by taking a copper plate and drawing on it, right? And then you ink it and you slap it down on the paper. and of course, the image that you get is going to be reverse of what you drew. So if you look at pictures of the flea after 1665, they're almost always pointing in the other direction. <laughs> so people were just copying Hook's picture, <laughs> printing it, and it came out in the other direction. So that's one way you can tell the ones that are plagiarized. And the other way is you just look at the detail on them, and it's all exactly the way Hook drew it. So. Uh, that's a, that happens in science even today. People keep copying things, whether they're right or wrong. But in this case, it was right. So the other thing, and uh, I started to make a mistake earlier, this picture is almost always reproduced in textbooks of biology. And uh, this is Robert Hooke's uh, picture of cork cells. Uh, which uh, he got by just taking a ordinary piece of cork and shaving it thin, looking at it under his microscope. And <clears throat> uh, Robert Hooke, in his very short description of this uh, particular specimen, <coughs> said uh, this cork is made of a very large number of little cells. Okay? He used the word cell. He went on, and if you read what he actually wrote, he clearly meant cell in the same sense that you mean a prisoner cell in the jail or any other kind of box which you would call a cell. Uh, this has been so many times misinterpreted that uh, this is nothing new to me, but uh, you'll read in biology textbooks that, well, the microscope was invented in 1600, the book saw cells in 1665, and we had the cell theory, and blah, 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 and now we have it in modern medicine. Mm. But in, <laughs> fact, uh, in fact, Hooke had no idea about the structure of animal cells. Uh, and he really didn't even uh, talk about other kinds of cells. This is just he drew a picture of a piece of cork and it had these little cells in it. So this has nothing to do with the cell theory. And that's the other that's the other theme of my lecture here is that not only the people get wrong about when the compound microscope was used, first used in the bedroom, but they get wrong about what was seen with it. So it was 200 years almost after the book before we had the cell theory. The cell theory didn't come in until 1838. Okay? So clearly this had nothing to do with the cell theory. And uh, I would also, the other thing that I want to main I'll give you is that the invention of the compound microscope probably didn't have much to do with the, the cell theory either. And so that the whole premise of uh, what you read in the biology textbooks very often is not correct. And what I'm going to try to tell you now is that although the compound microscope was invented somewhere around 1650 or so, and Hooke did all this wonderful work with the compound microscope. 
that almost all of the important observations on cells and the eventual promulgation of the cell theory depended upon people not using compound microscopes but using simple microscopes. And uh, this is hard for us to understand, partly because if we want to look at anything now, we use a compound microscope. And so we imagine, and the writers of textbooks imagine, that all these people were using compound mm -hmm. microscopes. But if you actually go back and look at the books published between Hooks, 1665, and the cell theory in 1838, you'll find that the ones that were really making important biological observations, particularly on cells, were using simple microscopes, magnifying glasses, if you will, and other people who were using compound microscopes were using them, I won't say as toys, but they were using them for demonstrating things or setting up something. Uh, a compound microscope is very easy to use because it's a big thing, you can put it on a table, uh, you can illuminate it correctly <coughs> and so forth. Um, but a compound microscope, by definition, has two lenses. Right. Now, one very important principle about lenses is that the only thing you can grind and polish is a flat surface or a section of a sphere. And it's just for technical reasons. Even well, maybe now there are ways of grinding non surface surfaces, but until very, very recently, all lenses had as one of their surfaces, and usually two, a plane or a sphere of a certain uh, <coughs> intensity, so a certain, certain degree of, 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 of sphericity, either flat or not so flat. Now, <coughs> um, the smaller you make the lens and the more spherical you make it, the higher magnification you get out of the single lens. Okay? So if you want high magnification, you have to make small lenses. And if you want really high magnification, you have to make them really, really small. I'm talking like a millimeter to two millimeters or three millimeters in uh, diameter. These are hard to make. They're very hard to polish. You, you, you have to polish them so that they're perfect. And even after you have polished them perfectly to perfect spheres, which is the only thing you can polish. You know, that's another <coughs> story. But you, you can't polish a non spherical <coughs> surface. You can only polish a spherical surface or, or a plane. Every lens has what's called <coughs> spherical aberration. And it's called spherical aberration not because, this is another misconception, not because the lens isn't spherical, but it has spherical aberration because the lens is spherical. And uh, if I go back here, the uh, thing that is you have to remember about this uh, picture here is that the image of the specimen is a replica <coughs> of the specimen itself only to the extent to which this lens is perfect. Okay? Now, the very simple physical theory is that in a lens that has two spherical surfaces, or one spherical surface and a plane surface, cannot form a perfect image. It has what's called spherical aberration, which as I said is not because it isn't spherical, but because it is spherical. To make a perfect image, that is where every point on this object here is exactly a point over here, that would require uh, an aspherical surface, which is impossible to make. Okay? So this image is not perfect. Okay? So it stands to reason that if you take another lens that has spherical surfaces and look at this image with that, you're going to add complications rather than improve the situation. So that in fact, a compound microscope with two objectives that have spherical surfaces forms a poorer image for the same magnification than a single lens of very small size and high curvature. And all the biologists or all the 
people who made microscopes in the 17th and 18th century knew this. And yet this simple thing has been forgotten or overshadowed by what people think was going on. And uh, the best proof of that, what I just said, is that the person who really saw microscopic objects in the 17th century and eight, early 18th century was Leeuwenhoek from Holland. Now, a lot has been written about Leeuwenhoek, and a lot of it is just nonsense. Uh, for one thing, he was a draper. That probably made money. He didn't make money making microscopes and looking at pond water. Uh, he was a draper. Uh, he was a very famous man in his time. He was born on the <coughs> same day uh, as uh, young Vermeer uh, in Delft. In fact, when Vermeer died, uh, Leeuwenhoek was his executor of his estate. So he was not a nobody, an unknown. Uh, when uh, Peter the Great visited Delft on one of his numerous uh, trips, the one person he asked to see was Leeuwenhoek. So, and uh, actually Peter the Great could speak Dutch because he spent this thing as youth in Holland, and uh, so they could actually talk in uh, Dutch. But uh, Leeuwenhoek has gotten a bad rap for a lot of reasons, one of which is he only spoke Dutch. He only wrote all of his papers in Dutch. He sent them to the Royal Society in London. They were published in English, usually as abstracts, in <coughs> short uh, abstracts, so that even the full papers were, were not published in English uh, until the, the uh, 20th century, actually. <coughs> Uh, they were, uh, some of them were uh, translated back into Latin, uh, so that we have Latin editions, we have French and German and English editions of uh, Leeuwenhoek's uh, <coughs> publications. <coughs> but um, uh, nevertheless, he was the one who really took uh, microscopy down to the cellular level, <coughs> and he did it with this microscope, or this kind of microscope, uh, and you may not even be, be able to see where the lens is, so I'll point it out to you, it's right there. Uh, the, and this uh, microscope is only a few inches tall. That lens is about two millimeters across, and to use this thing, you have to put it right up to your eye, like this, and uh, you, uh, you say, lay with them. Uh, would attach the specimen to this pin right here. So that pin is on one side of this you know, lens here, and your eye is on the other side. So that's a simple microscope. The object is here, the lens is here, the eye is here. And to get high magnifications, you have to have a small lens with a high curvature. But that microscope has fewer aberrations. That is, it produces a better image than Robert Hooke's microscope with two lenses. Everybody thinks a compound microscope is better because it's got two lenses. Actually, it's worse because the second lens adds aberrations to the first lens. So uh, what was Leeuwenhoek able to see? Not just fleas. Leeuwenhoek saw sperm, spermatozoa, he described that. He was the first to describe bacteria, if you can believe it. Uh, and protozoa, he described all kinds of protozoa. You can identify the species that he was looking at, or at least the genera that he was looking at, from his uh, very excellent drawings. And just to uh, give you one example, <coughs> here is Leeuwenhoek's drawings of bacteria. And you know, some people have said that well, he couldn't possibly have done it. He couldn't do these things were only a micrometer in diameter and a few micrometers long. But he did, I mean, the question he did. Uh, because now he could gone back and taken his microscopes, some of which are still in existence, and shown that you can actually see. Uh, this is a Latin translation of uh, one of, uh, it's a book written in Latin, it's a collection of the letters that he wrote in Dutch, that he then transliterated into English, and then back translated into Latin. Uh, and uh, you can, you don't have to know much Latin to see that Ningevalmea uh, means that he got these bacteria from his inside of his mouth, his gingiva. And 
there's one other thing that I always like to point out. Uh, you notice down here it says animalcula. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the things that annoys me most about description about Leverhulme. Because almost every book that you read, a textbook or an elementary book, says uh, Leverhulme studied animalcula. Okay, so what the heck is an animalcula? <laughs> what is an animalculum, actually, in proper Latin, or singular? Well, animalcula is one of these interesting words. That is a back translation to supposed Latin from the English little animal derived from Leeuwenhoek's Jurkins in Dutch, which is little animal or little deer, because tear in German is animal. Or, yeah. So anyway, this is this isn't a Latin word at all. And the people who use it, saying this is what uh, they were studying, are just making up um, um, an, an English word. There is no such word, English word as an animalculum or animalcula. And animalcula are microorganisms. So Leyland Hooks studies microorganisms uh, with his uh, not compound microscope, but his single <coughs> <simple> microscope. <coughs> and the reason he was able to see them was that he had a microscope with only uh, spherical aberration in one lens instead of spherical aberration in two lenses. So, what, what happened? Well, uh, Leonard Hook actually saw cells, but he didn't use the word cell. Uh, and in fact, uh, the word cell wasn't really used until the 19th century. So, the, uh, in the sense that we use it nowadays. So, what happened? Uh, between you know, 1700 here and the cell theory in uh, 1838. Well, not much actually in terms of really interesting uh, biology and almost no cell biology. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, simple microscopes were uh, common uh, objects of trade and people had simple microscopes. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this microscope has a single lens right there. It's shown here in, in uh, detail. And you had a slide holder here with various objects on it so you could look at four or five different things just by sliding this thing back and forth. It has a spring here to uh, keep the distance uh, constant here. And then a screw, big screw barrel here, which presses against the backside. So you put your eye here. Uh, here's the lens. You put your eye here, uh, you put the specimen in here, and then you turn the screw to focus it, and then it goes in and out. So these uh, single lens, uh, screw barrel, simple microscopes were actually quite common in the uh, 18th century. And this is probably what most people did who did any uh, serious microscopy. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, you have a lot of uh, books that have nice pictures. Uh, these happen to be ones that were not cribbed from uh, Robert Hooke. <laughs> uh, these are actually drawn uh, probably by Russell from himself uh, in 1749. <clears throat> but this is about the kind of magnification you find in images of biological specimens. You don't find lots and lots of pictures of cells and nuclei and that kind of thing because they hadn't been discovered by that time. So the idea that, you know, the microscope was invented in 1600, um, seeing wonderful things, cells, cells by 1665, blah, 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 now we have the cell, that's all wrong. Yeah, nobody had any conception about cells uh, in tissues until the 19th century. Okay, so you think, that uh, the next thing would be <coughs> that somebody would use a microscope like this, uh, which is actually from 1780, <coughs> uh, to make some really nice observations with uh, on cells. Uh, actually, they didn't. Uh, I can tell you about this microscope because I own this one. That uh, the lenses here are no better than the ones in Hooke's microscope. There's a there's a little lens down here. It's just a single piece of glass. Uh, it's nicely made, but it's nothing special. 
is another lens up here. Again, nothing special. Uh, this microscope would have shown nothing better than what books did, and <coughs> not as well, not as good as what Mayer did, saw with his single lenses. However, this kind of microscope, which has all of the physical features that we see in modern microscopes, namely a base here, a tilting base, uh, focusing knob, or a nice mirror, to, you know, condenser to shine light on the specimen, it all looks like a modern microscope. And so people looking at this, I'm sure, would think, oh gosh, they had really great microscopes in the 1800s. Well, no, they didn't. Because this is not a great microscope, it's a beautiful piece of brass uh, <laughs> machinery, but it's not a great microscope. Uh, I can tell you from a look at it still, and look at these two, <laughs> they look just like books, please. You don't, look, you don't see any cellular detail. Okay, so here's one that would really amaze you, uh, it amazed me when I first learned about it. Uh, the nucleus of the cell was discovered <coughs> in uh, about uh, 1825, thereabouts, uh, by an uh, Englishman named Robert Brown. And Robert Brown did not discover the nucleus of the cell with a compound microscope. He discovered it with a simple microscope, as you can believe. And uh, this is Robert Brown's drawing, or rather, excuse me, the drawing of Robert Brown's microscope. But the nice thing is that we still have Robert Brown's microscope. There it is. Uh, and uh, it is a simple microscope. It's got a uh, little lens right up there. That's the only lens. And you mount the specimen here. It's got a rack and pinion here. You turn this knob, this, this piece goes up and down. So you can you put your eye right up against there, and you focus it down to whatever the degree is necessary. But it's a simple microscope, one lens right there. And uh, with that, Robert Hook, uh, or two, Robert Brown, uh, discovered the cell nucleus uh, in 1845. And uh, there's the lens. And there is not uh, Robert Brown's <coughs> image, but this is an image of an onion root tip taken with Robert Brown's microscope, which is still in existence. And it shows, for those that you know, don't believe that you can see nuclei with a single lens, uh, there it is. Uh, this is actually taken with Robert Brown's microscope uh, by a man named Brian Ford, who uh, actually <coughs> popularized the idea that the simple microscope was the thing that really brought progress <coughs> in the cell theory at the beginning. So uh, there are the nuclei right there. Um, it's probably cheating a little <coughs> bit because I think this is a stained specimen. I'm not sure, I can't tell. Uh, but I think you could probably even an unstained specimen see the nuclei. And Robert Brown uh, obviously did. He didn't, he didn't stain these specimens. Um, I always like when I'm talking about Robert Brown to make one aside. Uh, Robert Brown, uh, when he was looking at uh, his specimens under the microscope, and actually he was looking at the uh, hair cells on the uh, leaves and uh, other parts of the plants, uh, he, was, he would squash the, the material in water on the, uh, his slide and then look at it. And he noticed that uh, <coughs> All the little things in the water were jiggling around. And uh, he described this in great detail. It came to be known as Brownian motion. And so the brown of Brownian motion is the same Robert Brown who discovered the cell nucleus. And Brown was very careful. Uh, although he saw these things moving when he squashed cells, and anybody who didn't do a thorough John would have thought, well, this must be because they're alive and they're wiggling around. Uh, he tested all kinds of things, and he showed that uh, coal dust and sand and whatever he put under his microscope, if he ground it up fine enough, it did jiggle. So he said, you know, this has nothing to do, this is not because these things are alive. He recognized right from the beginning that brown motion was an inherent property of tiny objects. Uh, he didn't know why, and of course, lots of things. It was Einstein who showed 
why uh, another hundred years later? Because of the molecular, <coughs> molecular uh, agitation that's going on. So anyway, so that's uh, Robert Brown, and we're getting near the end of our story here because we still haven't got important biological things being done with the compound microscope. Okay, <coughs> the, uh, the nucleus was discovered in 1825. The cell theory was uh, promulgated in 1838 by Schleiden and Schwann. Uh, they described uh, cells uh, in plants and animals. Uh, Schleiden described them in plants, and Schwann described them in animals. This was the origin of the cell theory. Now, Schleiden and Schwann did, in fact, use compound microscopes, but they didn't need to because any of the pictures that you see could easily have been done with a simple microscope. So this is a three cells in the, in the root hair. Actually, I think this is a potato, but it could have been almost any plant. The three big cells, uh, the nucleus is here, the nuclei is here and here. Actually, you can see the nucleolus there inside of that nucleus. So pretty much at the same time that the nucleus was discovered in the 1830s, uh, the nucleus was discovered as well. At, there, there are images earlier <coughs> of this that show the nucleus, but uh, from this time on, the nucleus was often used as a marker for the nucleus because many other things in the cell look like nuclei if you don't have them stained and, <coughs> and uh, identified in other ways. So the nucleus was often used as a marker for the nucleus. So that's 1838. Now, another misconception about the cell theory is that Schleiden and Schwann knew all about cell division and mitosis and all those other wonderful things. No. <coughs> they, had, they, they had knew nothing about mitosis. Uh, mitosis was not even observed for another 50 years. And what happened between 1838 and essentially 1880 was that uh, people who studied lenses figured out how to get rid of spherical aberration. Okay, now that's an entirely different lecture. But, uh, and you also have to get rid of what's called chromatic aberration because not only do these spherical lenses produce images that are not perfect, but they produce uh, images of different size depending upon the color. So that an object that uh, is blue would have its image uh, in one position, and an object that's red would have its image in another position. So that's called chromatic aberration. So you have both spherical aberration and chromatic aberration in these early lenses. <coughs> and the, during the 19th century, the methods were developed to correct both spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. And by about 1880, <coughs> lenses had been constructed which were as good as the lenses we have today because they essentially corrected uh, these two kinds of aberrations as well as you can do it with just combinations of lenses of different um, size and uh, curvature. <coughs> so, how do you get rid of spherical aberration and produce an image which is essentially a perfect reproduction of the specimen uh, is another long story, but it, it happened in the uh, 1900s between uh, excuse me, 1800, between about 1830 and 1880. So by uh, 1880, 1890, this is what the microscope looked like. Now this looks like a modern microscope in many, many respects. Uh, the big difference is the, this thing down here, the, the lens, because it's no longer a single lens as it was in all of these earlier microscopes. <coughs> but inside of there are, uh, in the low power uh, lens here, probably three different <coughs> lenses of different uh, curvatures and shape and size. Uh, this one probably has five or six elements in it, 
in this one as well. So replacing the single lens, which was the, the so-called objective lens in all these uh, earlier microscopes, were these very complex uh, multiple lens objectives. The, these <coughs> form an image up here, the real image, and then you still look at it with a magnifying glass. So the eyepiece is not much better than the earlier ones. It's just a magnifying glass. So the whole microscope, the, the crux of the microscope was right here. And that, because by 1880, it was possible to correct the aberration. So the only thing that I can imagine is that most of the accounts that we read now about uh, early history of microscopes were written by people who <coughs> started out with microscopes like this. And because they sort of look like that 18th century <coughs> microscope that I showed you, uh, they thought, well, people have been using microscopes since hope. They must have been seeing all these things. But obviously, they weren't. As I said, uh, the cell theory just barely got in with the uncorrected <coughs> lenses of the 1830s. And uh, chromosomes were not uh, discovered until this uh, kind of microscope is available, and none of the other uh, parts of the cell, uh, other than maybe the nucleus, uh, were discovered before this kind of microscope came along. And I think that there was just an incredible flower of information about cells that occurred between 1880 and 1900. So basically everything uh, we knew about the general structure of cells was really developed at that time. And so we had, uh, this is just an example uh, to show what you could do with these uh, new microscopes. Uh, they were, uh, the lenses were invented by a man named Ernst Abbe, uh, who was one of the co-founders of the Zeiss uh, Corporation, uh, Carl Zeiss and Ernst Abbe and Zeiss's brother. Uh, founded this company, and they made these microscopes based on the theory of Abe, and they basically brought the microscope lenses to perfection, which was not exceeded until just the last 10 or 15 years. That's, that's an entirely different story, because uh, the theory that Abe <coughs> used to produce these lenses was based on optical theory that came from uh, astronomers and uh, others who studied the nature of light. And the theory that went into the building of these microscopes <coughs> basically said, we've done it as well as it can possibly be done. And so from 1880 until just a few years ago, people didn't really try to build light microscopes that were any better than these uh, because the theory said you couldn't. Uh, we now, in the last 10, 15 years, we have so-called super resolution microscopes, and they exceed the limits set by the theory that Abe used, uh, not because uh, the nature of light has changed, but because the nature of the theory has changed. Uh, the, the theory was correct insofar as it went, but it didn't go quite far enough. So that's another story. But anyway, uh, this shows, well, this is a diatom, which is a, a single cell organism that lives in water, they're very they're common to find anywhere. Uh, they make shells that are made out of silica, and uh, for a reason that we know only from the diatoms, they have these incredible patterns on them. And they've been used since the time of the 19th century as test objects for microscopes. And so this is an actual image published by Abe himself uh, in 1888 to show uh, how good his microscope lenses were and to advertise the, the Zeiss uh, microscope. And if you just take this five micrometer scale marker here, which I actually put on the drawing, the drawing had a magnification but not a scale marker, you can uh, easily calculate that the distance between the centers of these holes uh, which are actually holes in the silica shell, um, are of the order of uh, half a micrometer. And that's about the theoretical uh, limit of resolution of the light microscope according to the theory of Lobby. So what he was showing was that he had built a microscope which resolved 
the finest structures that it was theoretically possible to resolve. So uh, using uh, this kind of microscope, then uh, things went very rapidly uh, in the next 20 years. And I'll just show you two uh, examples of this. Mitochondria were discovered in 1894 by Altman. Uh, here in this uh, drawing of uh, <coughs> gland cells from a salamander. Uh, these are the, the cells here, that's the nucleus here. And these little wiggly things here are the mitochondria. So uh, Altman uh, discovered these in 1894. But he suggested that uh, because they looked like bacteria, that maybe they were uh, little bacteria-like organisms growing inside the cells. Uh, everybody poo-pooed that idea, and he uh, got a lot of, of uh, flack for proposing that. But we now know, of course, that mitochondria have DNA in them, and they probably are derived by symbiotic organisms which invaded the cells millions and millions of years ago and, and set up housekeeping <coughs> in our cells. Uh, okay, so that's uh, mitochondria, 1894. Uh, chromosomes and mitosis, 1882, just two years after, more or less after uh, Abe invented his microscope. Everybody wanted these microscopes. And so uh, this is the first description of mitosis. It's remarkable in so many ways that it's hard to you know, summarize it. Uh, here's the cent centrosome here. So clearly here's the spindle. Uh, the chromosomes are clearly in the shape of a V. So here's the, the centromere of the chromosome. Uh, he recognized that the chromosomes, even though they were long, thin threads, they were not splitting longitudinally. They were uh, splitting along, uh, uh, into two uh, fragments lengthwise. And so he, he got it all in the very first object, very first uh, accurate description of my patients. So that uh, is more or less the end of my lecture. And so just to briefly summarize, uh, when people tell you that the microscope was invented in 1660, just remember the first images that were published was 1830, and there's some doubt about that, 1865 really. So clearly people were not using microscopes, compound microscopes much. The best that was done for the next 200 years was done with simple microscopes. And it wasn't really until the, the lenses were corrected in the 1880s that people really began to use compound microscopes to look at cells and all the other wonderful things that have come from it. So that concludes uh, <coughs> what I have to say. In the Galileo original telescope, yeah. you showed us the replica lenses. Yeah. Do the originals still exist within that working place? Uh, so far as I know, they do not exist. Uh, I'm not sure about that, though. But those are the ones that are there were definitely replicas. The second question is, when was the first photograph through a microscope, a microphotograph? Okay. Uh, that was around 1850. The photography was invented in, what was it, 1828? I think either 28 or 30, I can't remember. But uh, the first uh, images taken with a camera, <coughs> a photographic camera through the microscope were about uh, 1850 or thereabouts. Um, they were pretty, pretty nice images. Uh, I actually have the book in which they're, they're reproduced. Um, pho photography through the microscope was a, a real struggle for a long, long time, not because uh, people weren't taking photographs, but it was just very difficult to get a camera, because the cameras were big, the, the plates were glass plates. Uh, I hate them. I give away my age, but when I, when I was a graduate student, I uh, did photographs through the microscope, and they were a bear. 
it really was very difficult to take images through a microscope until we got small cameras that were built specifically for putting on microscopes and high-speed film, <coughs> all those things. Uh, quite difficult to take uh, images through a microscope, but the first ones were uh, uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, when Leibniz and colleagues were looking at these microorganisms, mm -hmm. and you know, he reported these things to the Royal Society, and scientists were looking at his, because he wasn't a scientist per se, right? Or, um, but he reported these things to scientists. Well, it depends on what you mean by a scientist. I mean, well, that's true. Basically, observer. basically, you couldn't make a living <laughs> doing the kinds of things that we do uh, in the 17th, 18th century. You had to have some other profession, pretty much. Either that or be wealthy, independently wealthy. So, so what were their reactions to things in your mouth and that they didn't know what they were? <laughs> Oh, well, I, I think they people were astounded. Um, yeah, they were. They just you know, some people couldn't believe it, and others were really quite amazed. Uh, one of one of the interesting side stories there is that uh, Leeuwenhoek <coughs> saw microorganisms in any kind of water fluid that he looked at. He saw them also in in the seminal fluid, and is the sperm, the spermatozoa. But he didn't uh, connect this at all with reproduction. He just thought these were more of these little animals uh, <laughs> swimming around in, in the semen, the way they swam around in all the ponds and, and uh, lakes and wherever he got the water from. Yeah. So, but he was the first to describe sperm, although he didn't know what he was describing. So, uh, uh, what about Staining. When was staining introduced? When was staining introduced? Yes. Um, that's a hard question to answer with just a single date. Uh, people were using carmine uh, probably by the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, the problem was there were not a lot of stains until the coal tar dyes were discovered in the middle of the 19th century. And um, so really there was not much staining done until after about 1850, 1860 or thereabouts. But the other big problem is you can't just take a piece of tissue and put it in a dye and get it. You have to kill the tissue and fix it and preferably section it. And you can't section it until you embed it. So. There's a whole technology that was developed from about 1830 to 1880, preceding the really good microscopes of uh, fixing tissues, embedding them in paraffin, cutting thin sections, <coughs> mounting them. All of these things had to be developed. And then the stains came along because these specimens needed to be stained to be seen because they were colorless essentially colorless uh, in their original state. So, so all of that technology had to be developed at the same time the microscope was being developed in order to make cell biology and histology uh, possible. So it's a little bit hard to say exactly when the stains were first used. But 1850s, 1860s, the coal tar dyes came in and then embedding the first microtome for cutting thin sections was about 1880. When they first describe cells as we know them today, did they immediately know that this is what Hook was looking at? So that's why they kept the cells? Or did that come along later? My own personal opinion is the reason is that Hook called them cells. <laughs> and uh, so people call them cells uh, probably that's a good question. I really would have to research that. I think that people call themselves in a, called themselves in the 19th century because Hook had called themselves. And Hook was looking at the cell walls, no question of that. But he did not generalize that to other uh, kinds of 
tissues inserted in generalized into animal tissues. That was definitely done in the 19th century. I mean, I know that primarily using microscopes is the reason why subcellular components of cells are well known. But there are other examples of like you know, chicken eggs or frog eggs in which you can see parts of cells with the naked eye. Absolutely. And I'm wondering where the association of what was seen in the microscope came to the understanding that we were already able to see. That's a very interesting question. He's, at, he's saying that there are certain cells that are big enough to see with your naked eye, which of course the frog egg and the chicken, the yolk of a chicken egg, for those of you who don't know, it's a single cell uh, with a single nucleus before it's fertilized. So there are some big cells, in the ostrich thing. <laughs> Austin Joke is probably the biggest cell. Um, it's interesting because uh, the, uh, this is, I work on frog eggs, so I'm quite familiar with this history. Uh, the, the nucleus, and I told this to your class this morning, the nucleus of the frog egg uh, was seen, in fact, the nucleus of the chicken egg was the first nucleus to be seen uh, by a man named Perkinji. Uh, he did that in, in uh, 1825, eight years before uh, Brown saw nuclei in plant cells. He didn't call it the nucleus, he called it the germinal vesicle because he saw this little clear vesicle in the germ cell, the egg of the chicken. Uh, so those of us who work on the nucleus of the frog egg always call it the germinal vesicle and we claim we have priority over the word nucleus. <laughs> so the, but to answer your question, uh, that really, it really wasn't recognized that the germinal vesicle was the nucleus until probably 1850 or thereabouts when people looked at other uh, egg cells, smaller egg cells, and saw that they had a nucleus and then they realized, well, that's just like any other cell. <coughs> Yeah, I think that was when they gradually recognized that, that the, uh, these big cells, and there are, set, there are some absolutely gigantic cells, there are cells this long, some alpha cells are this long. Uh, and so there are some quite <coughs> weird exceptions to what we think of as ordinary cells. But the ostrich egg is the biggest nucleus. <laughs> Um, I always show my students when I talk about reproduction the homunculus, a little sperm with a little man poured into it. Yeah. So when does this image come from? Uh, the image of the homunculus uh, <coughs> came from a uh, book published in uh, 1790. Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting image because it's often reproduced to show how ignorant and biased people were in the 18th century. So if you read what uh, he says, he says, uh, this is what one might imagine is inside this fur, which I show how it really looks in three pages later. So there's a drawing, a perfectly good drawing of the sperm uh, that doesn't have a homunculus inside it. Uh, but this drawing has always been reproduced as uh, claiming how people would use their imagination to see things through the microscope that weren't there. That's not true. He didn't. He knew that he couldn't see anything like that. But he said, "This is maybe what's there, because we know now the sperm is necessary to form an embryo. And there's nothing in an egg that looks like." Uh, you know, an embryo, so it must be in the sperm. <laughs> so. And it comes from a male. So in, res in this respect, you know, before the, the utilization of cameras, yeah. those people were drawing, and those drawings were actually quite beautiful, mm -hmm. and some artistic. So to some extent, I mean, I know Cajal, for example, pictures yeah. are absolutely amazing. Yeah. So to which extent they try to reproduce the reality, and to which extent they try to beautify it? So. Oh, I, I think that a lot of it was you know, trying not just to beautify, but to, uh, well, to give the ideal image. I mean, you look at a hundred different cells, they're all different, 
what are you going to draw? You can either draw one of them, which would not necessarily be representative, or you could make a mental image. And I think uh, that was what they were doing in many cases, although clearly Hook, Hook's flea was probably one flea that he drew. He drew it exactly the way he saw it. Actually, there's some interesting, there's some possibility that it wasn't Hook that drew that, but Christopher Wren, because uh, Christopher Wren, who was the architect of London after the, the Great Fire in 1665, uh, started out you know, with Hook to do this book, Micrographia, and then uh, he quit to do other things, architecture. And in the preface to the book, it says right there that the book was started by Hook and Wren, and that uh, Mr. Wren decided not to finish. So this, it's been thought that maybe, since he was the great architect, that maybe he drew some of these pictures of the So it's quite interesting to note that there seems to be a temporal disconnect between the first observations and then when the theory is put together and explaining those observations. So almost as if people can understand what they see only with a prepared mind. Like they must have almost, they must believe before seeing. And so I, what, what are your comments on this and whether we should try to learn something from that history to decide what is good science that deserves funding? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, Vision is a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, it's so immediate that you automatically think that what you see is reality. Whereas, of course, you're interpreting everything. Everything you see is an interpretation. But we don't think of it that way because we're so familiar with it. So I think you're absolutely right. You see something under the microscope, and you think, oh, God, I'm seeing it. It must be real. But it's all an interpretation. Very often, it's a two-dimensional interpretation of a three-dimensional object, for instance, that's one thing. So, I mean, I completely agree with you. You have to be very, very careful and not assume that just because you see it, that you understand it. So, Paul's question may to a certain extent raise another question, which is the kind of lucida, yes. uh, which is a way of objectifying mm -hmm. these, uh, these drawings. When was the kind of lucida uh, introduced? Um, I should be able to give you the exact date, but I can't. Uh, but camera is definitely being used in the 17th century, late 17th century, and all through the 18th century, that's, that's for sure. Uh, several people have written that they think Vermeer uh, used camera lucida to do some of his paintings because they are so lifelike and the perspective is so correct. Uh, I think you can debate that uh, endlessly, but because as far as I know, there's no written record that he used for chemicals, but they were available at that time. Okay. The chemical use, in case you don't know, is an object, it is a, 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 an arrangement of lenses and so forth where you look in and sort of like it projects it like a telescope image that you can look at directly uh, in, the, in a box. <coughs> but for microscope work, is there a, is there a good record uh, for when the camera lucid have started to be used? Um, there, there probably is, but I don't know. <coughs> for nematology, yeah. it's used a lot. Yeah, well, I, I never used the camera lucid because I could only see out of my right eye. Uh, my left eye, mm -hmm. and all camera looses are made for people with right eyes. Did you crawl over the looking glass? Actually, I, 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 I didn't answer your question. Maybe you, maybe you meant the camera obscura. Uh, I, answer I, for, I, uh, yeah, I answered for camera looses. <laughs> okay, so on this uh, through the looking glass, thank you very much, Joe.